All right, so I want to spend just a few minutes talking about the last um, Chinese philosophy after the Warring States period, and that will lead us into the Qin Dynasty. And so I don't think this will be as long of a lecture, but I am going to put another one on about the Han, so I'm splitting those up so they're not too long at one time. Uh, the, both these PowerPoints are online already, so you can look at the lecture, look at the PowerPoints, um, and uh, be ready for the quiz. All right, so legalism. Legalism is the one uh, philosophy that will be very easy to understand because we see it a lot in today's age, uh, this day and age. Unfortunately, we see it a lot. Um, the idea is uh, the same philosophy that's used by a dictator or a strong man in a particular country, and uh, it's it's very oppressive uh, form of government. But uh, if you have a strong leader, it works, right? So if we're going to define legalism. We have to ask the question. How did legalism want to bring peace to China? And the answer to that is through strong, uh, very oppressive government, right? The idea is that if you're going to make peace, you have to force the peace. You have to force people to be peaceful. So you pass strict laws, you reward people for obeying the laws, but you punish people for, uh, for disobeying the laws, and you punish them harshly. So the society must be brought under control by a strong central government. Obedience will be rewarded by but disobedience will be met with harsh public punishments, right? And so you will be punished severely, and everyone will see that punishment, so they'll learn not to do it, right? Um, so the central government will regulate all aspects of life, including actions and thoughts. So not just what you do, but what you think and what you say can be made illegal by the government. So I mean, we in America are used to free speech and, and, and a freedom of privacy, all that stuff. None of that exists in a legalist society, right? The government is in everything, and the government tells you what to do and tells you what to think. All right, so um, this is the type of philosophy that we see under the Qin Dynasty. And so an example of that would be the Qin. Uh, the Qin Dynasty was a small kingdom in central China that had taken some time during the Warring States period to build up its armory of iron weapons, to build up its military, and eventually when it felt it was ready, the Qin Dynasty began, or the Qin Kingdom began to spread out and conquer and absorb other dynasties to the east and west. Eventually they would absorb all the dynasties, and in 221 BC they would be the first uh, dynasty to unite all of China. The Shang and the Zhou Dynasty united large parts of China, but not all of it. And the, so the Qin Dynasty was the first dynasty of China, is officially, right? They united all of China, right? Uh, the uh, ruler of the Qin was in the West, we call him Shi Wang Di. Uh, he proclaims himself the first emperor of China in 221. Um, he established his capital at Xinjiang uh, and created a powerful legalistic style government, right, with many levels and many uh, levels of bureaucrats, but all power rested under him. So he limited people's power to, um, to speak out, he limited people's power to uh, freely go back and forth. Uh, and, you know, he was very, he was a strong man. He wanted to keep his empire intact, right? So, he ignores the nobles that rule, would rule over China, and he replaces them with loyal government officials, like we'd see with Persia or other empires, right? So, uh, he just ignores and pushes the nobles aside and instead puts his people in place. He divides his kingdom up into administrative provinces and has administrators over those provinces that answer only to him. And they're loyal only. Right. All right, so he maintained a large professional army, of course, and raised the high taxes to maintain that army. Uh, he forbade the common people to own weapons, and so everyone had to turn in their weapons. If you weren't part of the military, you couldn't have any sort of weapon. Um, and he built roads, and again, we saw this with Persia. If you want to have a modern, united empire that's easy to go back and forth, you want to build roads, and he builds he builds over four thousand miles of roads in China during this period of time, which uh, assisted trade and assisted communication. But as we see in Persia, it also assisted the military from getting one place to the other. Um, he impressed, and how did so? He had these large building projects like roads, and so he would use peasant labor to do that. And and with peasant labor, he would just go and what we'd say, I guess it's maybe a naval term. He would uh, impress or Shanghai these people into service, right? Just take them. And maybe they were guilty of a crime, maybe they weren't, but he just 
his army would go through a village and they just take all the able-bodied men and they would take them out and work on the road, right? Um, and just not being really is it convenient for you. It's, it's not a work tax like we see with the Egyptians and pyramids. He would just take them, right? So guilty or not, he would just take them. And they would, they would stay there as long as he wanted them to stay there. Sometimes you can even call it an enslavement would just enslave them and make them work and work and work and if some some would die we'll talk about that later on so that made him really unpopular even though he's advancing china through like roads and, and building projects he's also making himself pretty unpopular with the locals right um he also wanted to try and cut down on the attacks from the north we have that area of the north which is the asian steppe lots of uh, tribes in the north come south and begin to raid and and uh, and attack China. Well, the northern kingdoms had already built walls uh, up in the north to try to prevent those attacks. And what he did was he just combined those walls to create the first version of what we will call the Great Wall of China. And he did this with that same type of labor, conscripted, impressed labor, where they have to go and they have to build the wall. Um, many of them were uh, underfed. Many of them uh, were exposed in the heat and the cold. Uh, many of them were worked to death. Uh, the story is that thousands of people died building these projects of roads and walls uh, for Shi Huangdi. Now, you also, as we said, regulated ideas. And so your Taoist philosophers, your Confucius philosophers, were not allowed to think and teach and, and, and converse over their philosophies. Their philosophies were banned. Uh, one of the uh, examples that the book gives, which is a very severe example, is that in the capital city, um, Shi Huangdi rounded up. 460 Confucianist scholars and threw them in a pit and buried them alive in front of everyone watching. Where we talked about harsh penalties and public executions, and that's what we see here. So everyone could see that. He took all the Analect copies he could find and he burned them. He took all the Tao Te Ching copies he could find and he burned them. And he, he was trying to wipe out any subversive ideas that uh, would go against his government. Okay, so this is an example. It's one of the pictures. You can see it on the PowerPoint. You can't really see it as well here. But this is a scene, right? Uh, a description of the burying alive of the Confucian scholars. They're being thrown in the hole here by the army. They're burning the books right there. And so it was very, uh, very kind of a scary time to be in China during this period of time. You didn't want to slip up. If you slipped up, that was over. You were done, right? Okay, so now here's what he did do for China. Now, as a strong central leader, he was able to mandate some things that had been kind of wishy-washy beforehand. It not, there was no standardization of anything. And so in order to create order from the chaos, he actually did something good. He created standardized coins and standardized weights and measures. And what that means is you would have a coin, and the coin would be a certain weight of gold. And that gold would be a standard weight and measure. And so you didn't have to weigh the coin. You would just hand the coin. And we talked about this with Persia. Uh, Darius had the standardized coins with weights and measures, and Shi Huangdi does the same thing in order to help the economy move more smoothly, right? So you're not always weighing gold or always weighing silver. You can just give them the coin. So that was good. Uh, he created a standardized writing system. And we did talk about the alphabet and how the alphabet was a symbol rather than a phonic alphabet of pictographs. But what, what I didn't tell you was before the Qin Dynasty, there were a number of ways to write different words. Uh, there could be uh, a dozen ways to write the word horse in different kingdoms all around China. Well, Shi Huangdi wanted to get rid of that because it was confusing, so he passed a law that said everyone has to write this way. This is the word for horse, and this is the only word for horse you could write. And so he standardized that writing, which is, is good because now you can go to any part of China and read that standardized Chinese that everybody uses. And he also standardized the laws that everyone would follow. And so it's not a law between this kingdom and that kingdom. It is the law of China the law of the land, right? And so he standardized money, he standardized writing, he standardized law, and that helped unite China. Okay, so here we have a couple of examples. We have the coin at the top, and we talked about how early Chinese coins have the hole in the middle so they can carry them on a string. It made them easier. Then we have this early Chinese writing, the standardized writing of the Qin. Remember, this comes from the shamans who are trying to read the signs, and, and so eventually these carvings become the words of Chinese. And uh, this is a, an example of old um, Chinese script. All right, so uh, the emperor, at the end of his life, the emperor wanted to have a magnificent tomb, like most emperors and pharaohs and things do. And so what he did was he commissioned a large tomb city, is what it was, in the north of China, 
that uh, would have a mound that would have his burial place, but it would also have um, a number of uh, areas around the mound where he could put a massive clay terracotta army, right? Now, his, his vision was that he was going into heaven, and going to heaven, he was going to conquer heaven. In order to conquer heaven, he would need his spiritual army with him. So he, what, we, what we have is, and what archaeologists have found, are miles and miles of these massive pits with thousands of life-size clay terracotta soldiers uh, that were supposed to follow him into the afterlife. So this is an example, and, and I've seen these at the high. They had an exhibit come to the high in Atlanta where you could go and you could see a few of them, and you could see how they were made, and, and it was very fascinating. But I've known people to go and actually see the area, and you can't really get the scope unless you go and actually see the pit with thousands of clay soldiers. I mean, it's just so massive. Now, what also makes this interesting is every single face is different. So we believe that he actually had people sit and, uh, and model their face for the soldiers, right? And so this is an individual person that lived during the Qin Dynasty, and so is this, right? And notice behind them, you have horses, there, and then this chariot, of course, is supposed to be the chariot of the emperor, and that was terracotta, and it was down there, so everything he needs is ready to go. There were acrobats, there were strong men, there were either, like, even swans that, that like, would sit, and they would float in the heavenly streams, you know, and so I guess when you get to heaven, all these clay things come to life, and he's able to, like, be the conqueror of heaven, as well as the conqueror of earth, right? Um... Okay, so why does the Qin decline? It doesn't last very long. Uh, Xi Huangdi is only emperor for 14 years. After he goes, it is less than a year later that uh, the, the Qin dynasty is gone. Um, and so you can guess some of the reasons why he was very unpopular with the nobles because he shut them out of government, as we've already talked about. He's very unpopular with the peasants because he worked in the death and he taxed them too much for his building projects, right? Um, he also... Uh, is a strong ruler, but his son was a weak ruler. And so after his death, nobody is scared of the Qin Dynasty anymore. And so uh, he dies, and you have these massive rebellions, uh, and eventually and he dies in 210, and by 207, the Qin Dynasty is gone. Okay? Now, he's one of the most fascinating figures in history, um, the Qin, even, even though he only ruled for, like, uh, you know, from 221 to 210. Uh, which is a very short time. But he made his mark, you know, building the, the beginning of the Great Wall, even though it was built on the backs of the peasants, is still the symbol of China today. And China gets its name from the Qin Dynasty. Okay, so the Shi Huangdi, even though he was a cruel ruler, uh, he was a very short-lived ruler, he had a massive, massive impact on uh, Chinese history.